Hello and welcome. Today I am joined by Matt Konopinski, who is Director of Physio and Performance at Rehab for Performance. So Matt, thank you for joining. Thanks very much for having me on, Andy. No problem. I've been enjoying all of your uh, social media over the last six months, so we'll come back round to your new centre, which looks amazing, by the way. Um, okay. But yeah, I'd be keen to just find out a bit more about you, and I've met you a few times from uh, in your various roles. So how did you get involved with physio? Like, where are you from originally? So I'm from Leeds, um, and probably a bit, bit of a sort of tragic... Uh, story in a sense that um yeah my my lead into physio was based on wanting to work in football um so it was it was it was all based around that to be honest and i think you know as 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 a as a, an adult now when you look back at it your, your formative years where you're making decisions about going into a career and um, you make one so early like that and it's quite pretty immature uh reason for selecting a career but um that was it yeah I wanted to work in football um how could I go about doing that and how could I marry some of my interests um which were science-based biology-based sport-based um into a career um so that's that's where it was born out of um and uh yeah that's led me down my career to date Right. I wondered where you were going when you said how you could marry into it, but you know, that's, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, it's at what age then did you think, yeah, that's that's what I, I want to work in football? And then, how how physio? Yeah, I would have been yeah, probably 14, 15 at the time. You know, we, we go back and I, I think about careers advice at school when I was that age, and I really hope it's a lot better now um, than it was then. But back then was a case of very little assistance and um, looking through some books looking at what a physio does probably the glamorous side of things where you see someone running on the pitch and you think well yeah i'd like a bit of that the reality you know changes and is quite different when you're in that role um but that's that, that's essentially sort of uh was was my was my age when i started to think about it and you know, again, it, it was what what are the options um, based around subjects where I felt I was strongest in. Um, and um, yeah, probably fancied a bit of that running on the pitch. <laughs> so then, so that helps dictate what you're going to do for like A-levels or then going into um, the degree? Absolutely, yeah. So I chose my A-levels based around <clears throat> sciences um, so I did biology, chemistry and maths. Um, and look, I hadn't ruled out other things. So, you know, I, I hadn't ruled out medicine. Um, that was another option. Um, but that exactly, you know, that, that, that my subject choices were based on my strengths and also based on what I was thinking about doing. Um, and I had a sort of like slightly unusual application for the degree in the sense that um, I, I took a year out at that point and I was in South America. And so um, when I was applying for universities, I couldn't I couldn't attend for an interview. Um, now, the majority of the universities at the time were interviewing, but there were a couple that made an allowance for me. Um, so, yeah, I wound up at Kiel doing my undergrad degree there. Right. That is quite mature, like that sort of age, really planning it. If I think back to me, like I did sports science ultimately, but I sort of kind of fell into those things and I think even it was quite a mature view then for you because for me to even think maybe it's my small thinking that are you going to work in say Premier League is, is it I'm sure was the goal for you because that, that's that is quite that's quite aspirational to think of that yeah I, and but again when I think back to it I, I, don't, I don't I don't know that I don't know that I sort of like had said, oh, you know, I want to, I want to get to this point with it. I want to get to this level. I think I just wanted to be involved with football in some sense, in some guise. And I appreciate what you're saying there. That it's quite aspirational. I, I, I think back on it, and I think it was a bit immature, really, and a bit, um, a bit. I, I think maybe I lacked guidance in one sense. I.e., you know, I'm going, I'm going to do this because I want to be involved in football. You know, I, I was, I loved my football. You know, like, 
huge volume of the population and I think it was a bit naive <laughs> but it, it worked out pretty well for me um you know had I had a bit more guidance maybe I wouldn't have selected physio maybe I'd have done something different uh, well that's probably good that you didn't then in a way yes it's, mm. uh, it's, it seems to have worked out quite well so then when you're at university then so you've got this really clear vision in mind of that you want to you want to work in sport um and like physio that we know that that's it's quite an nhs focused course how did you find that like what, what did they ask you that question when you're going through your interview did they say where do you want to work and did you say no it's definitely football yeah i mean i i think <clears throat> you know we might get onto this but I've, I've i've lectured myself at um at salford since um so i've been on the other side of interviews now i i was i didn't actually end up doing an interview for university However, I think, you know, knowing what I know now, having interviewed other students, if I went in with that narrow minded focus, I don't think I'd have been accepted on the degree because, because as, as, a, as, as a university, you're looking for students or prospective students to have a bit more of an understanding of what physiotherapy is. Like you said, you know, it, it, it's a lot wider than I just want to go and work in sport. Um, and, and I think had I, had I gone to interview, I think I'd have tripped up because they'd have wanted me to have a little bit more insight prior to having the interview um, and also a bit more of an understanding. And look, I knew that physios worked in the NHS as well and in private practice, but I didn't really know what it entailed. Um, and, and to be honest, I, I enjoyed sort of the experiences of, of, of the different areas um, when I was at university and doing my training um it it didn't it didn't alter what i wanted to do um but it was good to get the the experience and good to get you know um that exposure to the different areas um and and some bits you still sort of like tap into even sort of like further down the line now um, yeah no it's interesting i was chatting with mike james recently we did one of these with him and he was saying the same thing he was a mature student going into physio but he'd been advised not to say he just wants to be in elite which is what he did want to do at that point um which i think because he went in mature it's maybe a bit different but maybe it is if you've got someone that's coming in at 18 that's saying no no i'm being in sport maybe they do think you're being naive with your expectations or so on i think it's partly that and also um, you know, wanting someone to have a bit more of an understanding and and, and have shown a bit more, um, you know, shown, shown a bit more about themselves to actually go and do some research themselves um, on what the job is, you know, and what the options are. Um, but also, also the the course is very competitive. So, you know, if if you're interviewing someone, you you want someone who is is going to engage with other aspects of the course and not just be you know a bit a bit blinkered in terms of their approach and where they're going so i mean i can see both sides of it i can see the side where if you're very focused no this is me this is what i want to do it's like you know part of me is like well hats off to you for for having that you know that that drive and knowing exactly what you want but then i can also see as a lecturer i can see the importance of um you know awareness of, of, of other areas and the potential for someone to maybe not engage so much because they're just not interested in that side of things versus someone else who might come on board that's that's going to be you know um think of it as a bit more of an inclusive degree mm. and so when you were doing that then when you when you're on your course and you do, you're doing your placements was there ever any point that you thought mm, is this the right course for me or did you ever think actually maybe i would like to do neuro or or whatever else I think I enjoyed those aspects, but it didn't, nothing sort of like particularly swayed me to, to want to do any of the other areas. Um, and, you know, that, that was, that was just me, but I know, I know people who sort of went into uh, our undergrad degrees, similarly to me, maybe really wanting to work in sport or in MSK and then, and they did diversify and, and, and end up working in other areas. Um, but it didn't really change for me. Um, I did graduate from university and spend three or four years in the NHS. Um, so I carried on working through other areas um, before my final 
sort of 18 months where I just focused purely on MSK. So you're still getting that exposure to it. Um, and it still gives you that opportunity to diversify if you want to. Mm -hmm. And then so how did you make that leap from, from that role into football? So I was fortunate. Um, I was fortunate at the time that one of my friends from uh, school, um, she was a player at Leeds United ladies team at the time. Um, so I ended up shadowing um, the physio that was working with them. That was my that was my initial initial break. I did that for about three months, and then a colleague of mine that I worked with in the NHS <clears throat> worked at Leeds United with the uh, men's academy, and a role came up there, and I was successful getting that role there. So I spent my first of like four years or so working in the NHS, but part time I'd, I'd work with the academy in the evening. All oh, right, now that's yeah a nice transition into it then. Yeah, and did that really confirm that you thought, yeah, this is this is what I want to do? It did, yeah, and you know, it's you you need that drive as well. I think there's a lot of staff at that level that support from a physio perspective, and they go in and they have a little taste, and then you get those that really want to push on and carry on with it, and others that go, you know, maybe maybe it's not for me. So it is a nice taste. It's a nice introduction. It's hard because you're working a full time job and you're learning your trade at the same time as then traveling, working part time. So it's taking up, you know, two or three evenings a week and then taking up the most part of your weekend. So that in itself was probably um, much to my sort of like unbeknown was also an introduction to, to what it's like to work in sport and that social uh, that demand on your social time. Mm. Yeah, no, no, actually, just going back to um, so what you said, so you had quite a clear vision. You wanted to be, you work in physio and in sport. Was there any people that stood out then that were in the game that you thought, right, yeah, uh, I want to be him, Mark Leather, Dave Fever, or anyone like that that you thought, yeah, I'm aware of them? I don't think so at that point. Um... I think at that stage, I was probably um, I was probably looking up to the senior medical staff that were at Leeds United at the time. Um, it wasn't like I graduated and I was and I was like I want to be like them. But as as I started to sort of like work in those areas, um, Dave Hancock was the head physio at Leeds United at the time. Um, he's gone on to have a really successful career. Did really well with them when Leeds United were in their pomp. And then as I've, you know, as, as I've developed and um, moved on in, in physio throughout the years, then there, there are certain um, certain people that, you know, that, that become mentors for you. And um, yeah, you, you end up sort of like using them as your as your touch points and, and the people that you sort of really look up to. Mm. What was Dave like to work with? I know he's a character. He's, we've done various things with him over the years. To be honest, Dave... Dave and I, at that time, we wouldn't have had that much interaction, but it was more just the, it was more just, I suppose, the sense that, oh, this guy is, you know, this guy is the head physio here. Um, so, yeah, and not not so much sort of like a relationship that, that we developed. It was probably more a sort of like um, the equivalent of uh, putting your favourite player and posting them on your wall type thing. It was like, yeah, this guy seems to know what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened from Leeds then? How, how did that, did you stay there? Did you move full time or what happened? Yeah. So I, um, my, my first full time role was, um, was at Barnsley. Um, so I was, I was feeling out really what I wanted to do around the time. And I, I, I sort of, um, I left football for a brief period of time to work, um, do some private practice clinics and just get a feel for that as well um just wanted to you know experience different elements really and see see where it was that I really wanted to end up um but that was a that was sort of like a brief transition and then um a part-time role came up at Barnsley Football Club so um you know that worked for me in terms of geographically um and then my first full-time role was there with their uh under 18s right yeah and then how was how was that experience yeah, so those experiences at Barnsley were, um, I would say, um, 
they were very sort of like very formulative in terms of um you don't have a huge amount of support there um you don't um you don't have a huge amount of in terms of facilities the facilities weren't bad um but that was a real sort of like um wake up call for me i think my first like full time role there um it was a wake up call in terms of the demands that are put upon you um and also a bit of a leveler probably in terms of how much experience i'd had to date to then be in a full time role and not have a huge amount of support in that role and i think that's a situation that a lot of practitioners get into um where you know similarly to me really keen to work in elite sport um you might get that role fairly early and the the support around you isn't really there to to optimally help you develop um and at times you know your development probably comes from making mistakes um rather than the the, the support and um you know the almost having kind of like a curriculum in place really to support you which would be the ideal Mm. was that something that like were you really shocked by that you expected with much better infrastructure i think i was yeah i think i was um and i definitely sort of like grew to think that that was almost the um the way that this the way that it was you know i i that was that was my first um that was my first moment working full time in sport and and so you know i'm thinking well this is how it is you know this is this is what it's like it's sink or swim so you know just get your head down and crack on with it um and i think the other thing is is you know having been relatively um, inexperienced in my career you know potentially not having built up a real good network of support outside of the club as well um so I didn't have a huge amount of people that I could sort of like touch base with and go oh what do you think about this you know um and get support from that perspective um but that's not the way it is everywhere um you know it was just that was my experience there at that time and I think you know as I said I think several clinicians will go out and get similar experiences because um because of infrastructure and um finances you know around the uh, the lower league clubs is a bit limited the flip side is is that you know you do get opportunities that you potentially wouldn't do elsewhere because of that um yeah. so it's it, it has its pros and cons yeah was there ever any point when you just thought this is too stressful too hard not what you wanted to do yeah definitely was and in, in fact my <clears throat> when when i um applied for a position at liverpool um whilst i was at barnsley had i not got that i potentially would have jacked it in then i think um but i was fortunate enough to to be successful go to liverpool and then actually join you know a team where you were supported you had experienced clinicians there um and it was you know it was the best thing that could have happened to me at that stage of my career mm. so so like going through that process you see the job at liverpool a massive club what what do you think like when you're looking at that is that something that you you know what you're going into is it like something that you think yeah i've got a really good shot at this like what's your thought process if you can remember You're asking me to go back a bit here um in terms of thought process with that i think i think it was driven partly by um you know i i i felt i fitted the criteria for what they were asking um on paper um and and i was looking to sort of be able to work in an environment where i was going to get support and i was i was going to learn you know and develop and i and i think I, at the time i definitely felt like i 
I, I possibly was was not developing um, in the manner that I wanted to. Um, so this was, you know, going to enable me to, this was going to facilitate that for me if I was successful. Um, so, yeah, they, 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 I think they were, the main, they were the main drivers for me, really. You know, it was like, um, I didn't feel like I, I was getting the support that I required at the time. And, you know, this is no slant on, on Barnsley um, Football Club at all. It was just um, the, um, that was just the structure at the time and the position. Um, but Liverpool, you know, Liverpool were going to provide me with that opportunity if I was successful. So, um, yeah, and the rest is history, really. Mm. And do you know why you were successful? Because I'm sure it's a really uh, oversubscribed application. I don't think I ever sat down and uh, had that discussion as such. Um, in 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 that manner, I you know there must have been loads of people. So why me? Um, but I think you know having having managed teams of staff myself, I think a lot of it comes down to whether you know you, you've got to have a certain skill set um, and be able to fulfil those things. But how are you going to fit in there as a team? player and what you like as a person you know that's the that's the biggest thing you know um for me is the, the key is is you want to work with good people you know um and um that quality you know is not always not always easy to come by mm. yeah well that's that's the thing in this so like what what would be like an interview or like going to a sports team that now you're doing the interviewing for your own company. But like, what are you, what do you think that people are looking for? Because you would, do they assume that you know the clinical aspects and it's purely looking at that fit? No, uh, the, you know, I mean, I think the, you can't assume that, that, that there's that, that level of knowledge or, or that the reasoning is there or the practical skills are there. So you have to, you have to, um, you have to interrogate those areas a little bit for sure um and and when you're doing the conducting the interview you know that's all part of it but also you know within that and i think what probably gets gets less sort of traction or is less obvious i suppose to to candidates is you're also sort of like really trying to get a feel for the person um and what they're like so you know the the, the cv's got them in front of you so you're kind of you're just ticking a box really by expecting them to have the knowledge and application that's required. Now, of course, if people haven't, then you know, then is that something that you feel like you can upskill them with, or do you need them to be at that level now? But you know, when you sit in front of someone and actually have that conversation, you know, and start to build a rapport, you, you instantly sort of get a feel for whether that individual is going to fit in with your team or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then how did you feel like when you go on your first day? Like, what's it like going to again such a like massive, massive club like Liverpool? Yeah, I was pretty nervous on my first day going in there. To be honest, um, I can remember, I can remember, I, 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 I'd gone up, um, and Rob Price was the head physio at the time, and we'd met, and um, he'd left me working with one of the uh, reserve team players, which is what I'd gone in to do. I'd gone to look after the reserves. It wasn't under 23s at the time. Um, team still had reserve teams. And I, I'd gone to work with one of their injured players, and, um, and then I got shouted down into the treatment room to, uh, to meet Stephen Gerrard. And that was a... Uh, yeah, I can I, I can remember that moment right now, like feeling pretty nervous. It's funny you say that. Actually, I did one of these with Kieran Cosgrave, and he said he was pretty much throughout his career, he's like, yeah, no problem, professional. Then when he met Stevie G, he's like, yeah, I think I think that's it. And um, I, I'd say, you know, similarly, really, that was the <clears throat> that was the one moment I always remember that that stands out. Um, haven't been fortunate to work with with a lot of high profile individuals but that one always stands out for me um you know and then i don't know how what we now sort of 13 14 years down the line um you know 
Stephen's someone that I'm fortunate enough to have a relationship with, whereby, you know, I can go and have a coffee with him now. And it's it's very, very different, very different to, to how I was at that point. But, um, you know, such a, um, such a, a worldwide, well-known individual um, and such a, such a great person as well. Um, so, yeah, nerve-wracking, definitely. <laughs> What was the, do you remember what that interaction was like then on that first time? I think he was having a go at Rob for not, uh, for, for not having me, uh, sort of like having been introduced to me earlier. So it was all a bit tongue in cheek, really. Um, and then uh, I've got vague recollections of just being sat in the treatment room whilst, whilst he was getting treatment and sat on the bed next to him and we were just having a bit of a conversation. But, um, yeah, that, that, that that's how I recall it. Um, and it, you know, it's those moments pretty quickly when you're working with people day to day, you know, Stephen always and still does have a presence about him. But when when your interactions become daily, um, that that does pretty quickly sort of fade away um, and, and you're going to work and these are individuals that you work with. Mm. Yeah, and so what was that? I mean, Liverpool is your longest role that you've been at. But how why was that? And like, what was that whole experience like? Like, did your role change as you was there? How, how did that happen? Yeah, so I think that was part of why I was, you know, I, I stayed there for a long time because um, there was there was the opportunity for for development there and for my role to really change. So I went in as reserve team physio. Um, I was based at Melwood, where the first team were training, so we were all together. Then. The reserve team got moved over to the academy side. Um, so my role changed a little bit because I had to become a little bit more um, of a lead at that point because there wasn't the support of the first team staff around me um, on a daily basis. Um, so that became a bit more of a leadership role. Um, and then we ended up, you know, the, the reserves became the 21s. Um, and we ended up with our own multidisciplinary team around the 21s. Um, so I was building that. Um, we didn't actually have we didn't actually have a site to go to in terms of a treatment room um, when we first went there. So ended up being part of developing that, which um, which was which was good. Um, and then after a couple of years, I then went back into a rehab role with the first team. So not back into a role I was already in, but back over to Melwood. Um, so switched again. So again, my, my role changed and developed. Um, I was really able to really sort of get my teeth into, into rehabilitation and working with long-term injured players. Um, and that's what I love doing, you know, that's, that's, that's the part of the job that I really enjoyed having, having a lot of time to spend planning and detailing what you're going to do with an individual and then delivering it. And seeing those outcomes, um, and then and then my, my final time there, um, I actually was head physio. Um, so I think I was I was able to sort of like experience several different roles there, um, which ultimately sort of like led to me spending you know spending ten years at the club, um, and uh, and thoroughly enjoyed it. So for that role within rehabilitation, then, is that how, how does that come about? Was that an existing position or was it something that you suggested or were asked to do? I think at the time, I think at the time, it, it, that, that specific role um, was, all, was pre-existing, but the, the sort of like manoeuvrings within the club in terms of people um, changing their roles just meant that that slot became available. Um, so Chris Morgan was in that position previously. He then went up to become head physio. And so I came across and slotted in there. Um, you know, it, the, the transition there is probably something that, you know, happens quite frequently at clubs. Um, and it's a good way of doing things in terms of like retaining your staff, I think, because if you, if you can see that there's potential to, you know, to progress your career, um, at the club then that engages you in what you're doing and you know it it 
it does help with staff retention. Whereas if you work in an environment where, you know, okay, oh, I'm, I'm currently doing this, but you know, I'm not, I'm never going to be able to do that because they're always going to pull in externals. Um, then you might get less staff retention. And I think there's sort of like staff, um, you know, the, the feeling around, around the group and, and the team uh, and the atmosphere would be impacted. Um, so yeah, it was, I think it was good. I think it's a good, uh, it's a good model to have. Mm, yeah, no, makes sense. And something, me being an Everton fan, obviously I've got my own opinions on Liverpool and feelings about that. But sadly, like they, they seem to have just like a great sort of team spirit or something around Liverpool. Like it's obviously in terms of Anfield and there's that historical thing. But certainly from like the, the current team under Jurgen Klopp and so on, they seem to have a really, really tight knit team. Does that translate into the backroom team and like the, the medical staff? And of course, they've got like the boot room from the historical side. So they've got a history of, of that sort of um, real tight knit team. Yeah, I think like, uh, I think it probably gets underplayed really. And there's a, maybe a lack of recognition that that, that, that culture <laughs> within the team, you know, is so important. Um, now, don't get me wrong, you know, part of what, what breeds that that camaraderie and, and and helps with that is success. So you know teams that are successful, you know it's it's an easier place to go into work. You know um, everyone's generally more upbeat and happier. So um, it tends to help things move along a little bit. And Jurgen's been really successful, so that's that's very helpful, isn't it? Um, but you know for sure, um, it's it, it's. It's it's a special it's a special club to have been involved with. Um, there's a lot of history there, um, both on and off the pitch, and and I think that's I think that history sort of it, it does it does pull people together and and it provides there is like a very tangible link between you know the club and the people who work there and the fans, um, you know, and a lot of it has come around through some tragic circumstances, but there's um, there's definitely sort of like reciprocated feeling there. Um, and, you know, you, again, the the connection, you look at the connection that Jürgen's got with the fans at the moment as well, you know, it's, again, it's, it, it's very tangible. It's there for you to see. He's, he's essentially kind of conducting the crowd, isn't he, there after games. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a unique experience to work there for sure. Mm, yeah, no, he's he's incredible, isn't he? He's yeah, done an incredible job there. So, how does it come for you then? Like, what made you want to leave? I think I, I just got to well, there was a couple of things. I got to I got to the point where I felt like I did need a new challenge. Um, I wanted to experience working in a different organisation. Um, so that was part of it, and also. You know, from a from a personal perspective, I'd been there a long time, and during that time, I got married. I had three kids. You know, so the sacrifices that you make when you're working in those roles, those sacrifices um, are felt by your family and by your friends, um, because ultimately, it's the time with them that you're sacrificing. So, those two things, I just got to a point where it. it sort of like it's strange in the sense that the team were sort of like highly achieving and we're going to go on and continue to achieve um but yeah for those reasons I just I just had to make the change so um so I noticed the role come up with the FA and I was like do you know what I mean that might give me that balance that I need um whereby I can pull back a bit of time at the weekends etc um and spend time with people that are important to me whilst also being able to further myself a little bit more in terms of an organisation where there were several people there that I really respected um, and really was really looking forward to working with. So I jumped jumped out of Liverpool into a role at the FA. Mm. And then what was the role? My role was working um, with the... Um, essentially working with the under 18s, under 19s, under 20s um, and leading that area 
Um, so there's there's approximately eight sides, uh, eight teams on the uh, on the men's side, and and there are three of them. Um, they fall into their own bracket, um, and my role was to was to provide physio for one of those squads, um, but also oversee the other three. Um, and as part of our role there, also we were, we were involved in research and developing um, provision of services across all the squads as well. So it was, you know, it was a, it was a role that had some really um, good challenges for me. Um, and as I said, you know, people that I was really keen to work with that I'd had interactions with before um, were real attractions to that job. Mm. So was that St George's Park based? It was, yeah. Did yeah. you have to move? Didn't move. Um, so I, I, I sort of like work, um, work out of SGP three days a week um, and more often than not, work from home two days a week um but there was a significant proportion of the year where you where you're away with squads so international break you'd be away with squads and then we also supported you know although i was overseeing the older teams you'd also provide support for the younger teams and they they wouldn't have their games in international breaks they tended to do theirs in half terms for example so there were significant portions of of time when you when you're away you know generally away doing a 10-day camp um so i would say you know probably a third of the year really you you're, you're away doing um you're, you're away supporting the teams how was that then bearing in mind you moved to uh to sort of spend more time with the family and kids like how, how what was the impact on that yeah and, and and you know i'd hold my hands up and say that was potentially a bit of an a bit of an oversight on my part um that was tough but it, i mean it was offset at the time by um, it was offset at the time by being able to pull back time at weekends, you know. So that was that was so unique to me, having spent you know about 14, 14 years without that. Um, so yeah, it had its it had it, it had it had its had its pluses and minuses, like all roles do. Um, but for me at the FA. It was a it was a real um, it was a real good exposure to um, to working with with people from from different sporting backgrounds with with a lot of knowledge um, and I, you know my big take home from it is the staff base they've got there are, are excellent you know really really good really knowledgeable um, so it helped me and it definitely developed me from a strategic planning perspective as well which I think has helped me, you know, um, deal with what I have to deal with now, definitely. Who was some of the team that was involved in that then? So Steve Kemp, head physio. Um, so um, some really good interactions with Steve. Um, ben Rosenblatt, strength and conditioning. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time working on uh, on a project together, the three of us. Um, also, um, John Power, um, one of the docs, um, we, we, we worked together sort of like quite a lot in terms of camps that we were on, um, and clinically, you know, um, got bits and pieces off each other. So some really good relationships and, and, and others as well, you know, um, getting some, some awareness of women's football as well, which, you know, for me, I was a bit naive about, to be honest, having worked on the men's side all the time. Um, so I think that's, that was really useful for me. And again, it's been useful for me, you know, moving forwards. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds it. So how did that come that you would leave the FA? I got the opportunity, um, to, to go and work with Steve and Gerard at Rangers. It was just too hard to turn down. Really. I was all, also the opportunity to work with a, um, a colleague of mine, Jordan Milson, that we'd, we'd spent like years together working really closely in rehab at um, Liverpool um, and just had such a good relationship um, that it was it was just an opportunity it's very hard to turn down something like that um, again going to another club that's got a real rich history um, amazing fan base um, and the project as well you know really appealed to me um, 
it was it was going in and and and, and leading um, the medical uh, side of things from a physio perspective up there, um, being able to um, being able to model what was happening both across the academy and the first team. Um, so the, the, it was a good challenge from that perspective as well. Um, so yeah, that's what that's what took me up there. Um, in COVID times, which was, uh, you know, as everyone knows, was it was a challenge in itself. So that must be really flattering that you get the call. He wants you to go up and, and build the team. Um, and like, do you, when you did you have any expectation that that was going to happen? Um, no, n not other than you know the soft conversations that happen around, you know, discussions mm -hmm. around potential for things like that. Um, I suppose, you know, with your relationships that you, that you build as you, as you work with people, you know, there's always potential for, for moments like that, I guess. Um, but you, you're not consciously thinking about that at any time. And, um, again, I think it comes down to trying to be a good person and trying to do the right things. Um, and I think people ultimately acknowledge that and respect that um it was it, it was it was tough in many ways um going up there um you know the, the the family didn't end up moving up there with me because because we got hit with covid that sort of like put a um put a halt to that process um and some other um you know some other um personal um aspects that were going on um within within the wider family just made it a little bit difficult um so it was it was a period of time where it wasn't as long as i wanted it to be um, but i had to make the decision to to be back with my family um so it that would have been 2019 um and around July, August, September, I think October time, um, I started, I came back and started lecturing full time at Salford Uni. Right, yeah. So did you, did you get some experience in Old Firm? Do you know, I don't think I did experience an Old Firm. Um, I don't think I did, no. Yeah, that's that's on my list of things to do. So I can imagine. I'm sure you'll you can get up there at some point to do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I think the just 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 the way that the fixtures uh, the fixtures lay. I don't think I did. Um, but it wasn't that I couldn't have done. Again, I suppose it comes down to, um, you know, one one of the things that I um, that I did when I got there was I was like, look, you know, we already had a member of the team that was like running on the pitch and what have you. Um, and that wasn't that, that that's sort of like wasn't anything that I felt like I needed to do. I wanted to um, try and improve the service and uh, and manage, but didn't feel like that needed me to be the person who ran on the pitch. So, um, yeah, uh, there, there would have been a sort of like a couple of old firms where I was in the car bombing it back down to uh, down the M6 to see the family. Yeah, priorities. No, it's good. Mm. And so academia, is that something that you'd always thought that you did want to go back into? It's something I've, I've always sort of um, been interested in research and tried to try to maintain some link with that and have research projects going on at the time. Um, and I made a fairly quick call that I was going to um, going to leave Rangers and come back. So it was like, OK, I'm going to come back. I need to. I need to probably take a break from football because I need to be more available for the family um, for both our sakes. So what are my options? Um, and, you know, academia was really appealing. I was fortunate enough to, to be successful when I applied for the role. Um, and, um, and yeah, it was something I, you know, that I thoroughly enjoyed um, and still maintain links with them um, because of that. Um, however, <laughs> When, when I was making that decision that, you know, I need to do something, um, this project that I'm currently involved with was, was, was also there at that point in time. And um, 
I'd, I'd, I'd always wanted to um, try and replicate the environment that you get at a top class football club and make it available for, for the public because it's, it's only the chosen few that ever really get to experience it. But always being in a full time job, you know, it's, it's, it gives you that sense of, you know, it's a bit safer. Um, however, I was, at, I was at a point now, I was like, well, if I'm ever going to do it, now's the time to do it. So um, this started to bubble along in the sidelines as well. So how did that, how long had that been in the back of your mind for? Probably about 10 years. Yeah, probably about 10 years. Myself and um, the co-founder at Rehab for Performance, Chris Morgan, we'd, we'd had conversations about it before. Um, we'd, e we'd even sort of like had conversations with other potential stakeholders, but never, never really sort of, never really acted on it. You know, to the extent where when I said, you know, said to my wife, we're going to have a go, you know, and she was like, I don't want, you don't want to hear about it because you've said it so many times. It's never going to happen. Um, and the rest is history. Just out of interest, I don't know if you remember, well, you you asked me, I think you I don't know whether you just moved to England then, but you asked me about one of the systems that we sell. You're like, I've got this thing, this project. It's not to do with anything I'm doing, but I'm just wanting to ask about it. So I've never asked you that question, but... Do you think that was that, do you know if you remember that, but you were formulating, I think it was a, basically we do a functional isokinetic dynamometer. Right, yeah. Do you yeah. Think it was, was it for that, do you think, or was it for the work you were currently doing? I can't remember. I would have thought it was for this. Yeah. To be yeah. honest. And, and, you know, these conversations, they, you know, they're kind of like conversations over, over, over a coffee or a beer that, never really um never really progressed but ultimately it did yeah no that's what it seemed like it was like yeah this is quite a random request i'm sort of just thinking about that so when it when i saw like rehab for performance come up i'm like hang on right yeah because i remembered that from from back in the day so how does it actually go from being you've got an idea how does it how do you make it work like where do you pick where you want it to be who you want to be involved with what what is the vision for it yeah so um where do i start i mean we i remember we, we sat down with our financial advisor um just to just to try and get a sense of whether it was even realistic to be honest and and how how we do it we had to think about how we were going to finance it um and the setup and model that we put around that you're right you know where do we do it um we chose to do it in Liverpool for, you know, the obvious reasons that our connections are here. You know, we, we have connections from a professional perspective with uh, with those that we might want to link into as externals. Um, but also, you know, we're inherently linked to the city in terms of what it's given us. Um, so we wanted to try and give something back to Liverpool as well. Um, and then in terms of you sort of like touched on who 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 do we get involved you know from a from a staffing perspective again it falls back to wanting to get the best people best expertise but also um them as characters you know being really really good people and when you work in a bigger organization you don't have that luxury of being able to being able to choose who's working with you whereas whereas here I'm very fortunate that you know that I do um and you know we're, we've also been fortunate enough that the vision was shared by by other people um who wanted to come and work here so um you know we we work alongside Dr Nigel Jones who's a sports and exercise medicine consultant um also one of our directors um who's the um, chief medical officer for British Cycling um Joe Gibson you know, who's a worldwide renowned upper limb specialist. Um, she she does our shoulders. Um, and then I sit in here as the lower limb specialist. So we try and provide that level of expertise for individuals, you know, that's relevant for their area. Um, and we also were fortunate enough to, um, to get a top draw strength and conditioning coach on board with us, Alan Jordan um who'd worked previously at game changer liverpool and everton 
and 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 other staff members who I've who I've not mentioned, um, but you know, don't want to bore the listeners with. But it's more the premise of you know being able to being able to cherry pick who you work with is is you know is really um, is really you know it's a it's a nice place to be. You know, it's a privileged position to be in, really. Um, but then the wider the wider learning was around, you know, how how do you how do you write a business plan? You know, um, that's been an evolution. And then also, I think a big part of where we've been successful is is having people alongside us that can guide us and give us the right advice. Um, and we've been very very fortunate from that perspective. So, you know, our, our branding. Um, our, our accountants, but they, they all come about from referrals and, and the referrals come about from people that you've met through your career and, and what have you. So, um, you know, everything that's gone on up until this point has, has established this position and enabled us to, to link in with these people. Um, so, yeah, fortunate and, and fortunate to be able to um, get the investment um, for the facility as well. Um, to be able to to you know create it and make it a reality yeah no it definitely helps if you can uh, well because I think I was saying before we started this how it looks really really impressive and everything that comes out of say social media which is where I have got most of the insight of for it just looks really impressive and it's exactly what you were saying in terms of you want to offer top quality services that are found in elite level sports, but to the general population as well. So it looks really good. Like how stressful is it for you, like going from that position of being employed? I know the stress is within working in sport for sure, but how 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 do you manage that? Yeah, the the stresses of sort of the bank balance and the, what, what's coming in. I think um I think it stressed me more in the sort of like formative months, whereas now I, I try and just be of the sort of like opinion that, you know, that there's nothing to be gained by stressing about it. So it, it doesn't help. And I just put it to the back of my mind, to be honest. Um, you know, like I said, you know, fortunate enough that we've got you know, good good assistance in terms of our, our accountancy and, and bits and pieces like that. And yeah, to be honest, I think you speak to other uh, business owners and they give you a sense check in terms of, you know, you, you've started a new business, you know, if you make, if you're making profit within the first two years, that's, you know, that, that's an achievement. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just gaining that sense of reality and just trying not to let it stress you out too much. Mm. Well, not to depress you, but we're just 10 years old now and I'm still uh, loads of stresses. So it's always there, but it's <laughs> it's exciting stuff as well. And that's the thing, I think, like for you saying that like, picking who you're working with and and all of that, that's what's exciting, isn't it? And, like the money, as long as you you can keep things going, that's, that's, that's it. amazing. That, that's it. And, and do you know what? It also, though, it, it, it adds another... Um, it adds another interest because you feel a sense of achievement if, you know, if things are going well from a financial perspective. So you get other wins, whereas my wins have always been about, you know, um, you know, getting someone back to full fitness and, you know, watching them back on the pitch. And, you know, I still, I still get that here, but there, there is like, there's, there's some added benefits as well, you know. No, no, definitely. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. Still definitely celebrate those, those things as well. So have you got a vision of where you think you, you, you want to go? So the vision is to um, is to to expand to be able to um, for, for R4P to become become a recognisable brand um, certainly across the country. So we've got our first um, facility here in Liverpool, and um, this is our flagship facility. Hopefully, hopefully many others um, to come. Yeah, that sounds exciting. And then last question, because I know we've gone over time here, but like if you all many, many things that you've been involved in, what would you say stands out as particularly memorable moments? Ooh, like so many. Um when I when I was at Barnsley, even being involved in the uh, in the League One playoff final that we won, um, that was immense. Um 
I think, you know, starting work at Liverpool and being involved, you know, in the highs and lows while I've been there. Um, there's been several. The individuals that I've got to work and meet with, you know, I've been, like I said before, in a very privileged position. Um, but I would still sort of like say the, the things that, the things that sort of like really sit with me is the, um, is, is when you really get that sense of appreciation from, from an individual, um, you know, be that an elite professional or be it someone that I work with here and they're genuinely appreciative of what you do because, you know, a lot of the time you'll work with individuals and, and maybe not really get that feedback. Um, they see you as a service provider um, and may not really, um, you know, may not really give you the feedback from that perspective. Whereas, you know, again, here in, in, in previous roles, when you spend a lot of time with someone, you know, you might spend six, 12 months with an individual, um, getting the feedback's great. So yeah, there's, there's, there's those variances, I suppose, from the, the more glitzy side of things and, um, you know, being involved in, uh, you know, finals and, you know, the Champions League final in Kiev was ultimately, you know, the result wasn't good, but, you know, what an experience to be involved with. Um, but yeah, it's the, it, it's, it's the moments where someone says, says, thanks, really appreciate that, that, uh, that, that I think, you know, um, I really appreciate. Yeah. No, well, that's a good positive note to finish on. So I'm sure you've had plenty of those conversations with people. But Matt, I really appreciate you sharing your time. I know how busy you are with, with running and uh, developing the business. So thank you for, for sharing your time. Well, thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. No problem. Cheers, Matt. Thank you. Bye now.